Okay, thank you everybody for joining our webinar today. My name is Alex Oliver. I'm a certified financial planner at First National Corporation. This is our third webinar in a series of four uh, this tax season. Uh, strategies for Secure 2.0, Massachusetts Millionaire Tax, and the Expiring Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. I know it's a riveting title, um, but a lot of new legislation over the last few years that I'd like to have the opportunity to just talk through and see if there's anything that might be relevant for you and what kinds of strategies I might be talking to my clients about uh, over the next couple of years as these rules get implemented stage by stage. Uh, we'll go through the webinar here. Uh, we have a chat box for the webinar. I've gone ahead and sent a message here. If you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. I'll answer them at the conclusion for anything specific that we've talked about or anything maybe even we haven't talked about uh, that I can maybe address. By way of a brief introduction to First National Corporation, we are what's called a registered investment advisor located on the south shore of Boston, down in Rockland, Massachusetts. We've been around for about 45 years now, if you can believe that, with uh, over 500 uh, families, $800 million in assets on our wealth management side. But then we also have a dedicated retirement practice where we manage 401k plans, 403b plans, cash balance plans, simple IRAs, you name it. Uh, dedicated to uh, servicing those plans. As a fiduciary, a legal term here to say that we act on behalf of our client's best interests. So uh, ensuring that we, if we custody at Schwab or Fidelity or have your 401k or Empower or Mass Mutual, we're a completely independent company and choose all those different firms and investments based on merit alone. Uh, again, I mentioned that this is our third. Uh, if you are just joining us for the first time, Back in February, I did a webinar on investment vision for 2023. I think a lot of that still holds up, even though the Silicon Valley Bank uh, issue over the last week or two, Credit Suisse also coming up in the news, may have affected some of the comments in that webinar, but might be still good to recap 2022 and get a little uh, idea as to where we stood going into the year. Uh, three weeks ago, we discussed cash balance plans for small businesses, uh, going into the weeds of how that all works, certainly a niche topic, but very relevant for those who do want to entertain cash balance plans. Uh, again, today's webinar on tax legislation. And then in three weeks, we'll be doing a webinar on building generational wealth and leaving a legacy. I'll tease this a little bit because some of the rules that we talk about today from these uh, acts and tax legislation actually are going to be implemented in this webinar as well uh, to make sure that we're leaving our assets in a tax efficient manner. So. If today interests you at all, I would encourage making sure that you sign up for that one. You can go to fncadvisor.com slash webinars for all registration links. And then all recordings of our webinars get posted within 24 hours of that. And these are all YouTube links. So any issue that you can think of, I try to every year find some different topics, socially responsible investments, social security strategies. We've done estate planning in the past. We've gone over the basics of how stocks work. Uh, you know, again, you name it, um, different financial planning kinds of conversations. I think these are good sparks for a conversation for either myself, Mike, Jason, or Ken here at First National Corporation, or your own advisor if you uh, have another advisor that you work with today. Okay, and then before we really get into the uh, meat and potatoes of our presentation, as always, a disclosure here to consult your own advisor or conduct your own due diligence before making any financial decisions. Everything I talk about today, just look at it like it's entertainment. I'm just uh, entertaining you today and not giving any specific advice because obviously I don't know your specific situation. So I'll be speaking in generalities today, uh, but that does not mean that uh, they are necessarily pertaining to you. Okay, maybe a couple of other disclosures or things to talk about. Uh, if you've worked with me, uh, you might have uh, heard me say this in the past. This is, uh, I think, more of an accounting um, term of don't let the tax tail wag the dog. Uh, because when we go over all these new legislations, and again, there's a lot of them, we're going to be talking about things that happened in 2019 from Secure Act 1.0, uh, Secure 2.0, just passed this, to set this past December, so it's really relatively new, um, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2017, and then there's even more things like the uh, PPP program and employee retention credit that happened during COVID. There's just so much out there. And so one of the jobs for me is to learn those different laws and see which of these clients pertain to which different aspects of legislation. But at the same time, trying to trace a tax break um, may have unintended consequences. 
So it's not always wise to focus on that completely. But at the same time, the whole point of the presentation is just to make you aware of what is out there. And the more conversations you have with your advisor, the more we can start to un uncover uh, different areas. Obviously with my clients, they might have assets that I manage them, or re retirement accounts, brokerage accounts. But they also might have real estate holdings that they have that I'm obviously not managing directly, but they certainly intertwine and they have interactions. And in a lot of ways, uh, I'm coordinating with the accountants to uh, see what is the right overall plan. So it's good to be aware of these things and see what might be relevant to you. So let's dive right into it because we have a lot to get to today. And I'm going to start with the headline of Secure 2.0, what a lot of people are paying attention to, uh, which is that required minimum distributions are now going to be delayed one more year starting this year. So they used to be, I should actually say they used to be 70 and a half. They then were moved to age 72. And now starting in 2023, your required minimum distribution age is age 73. Let's take a step back and, and talk about required minimum distributions. If you're in your 50s or 60s, you might not even be aware of what this is. Uh, but all this time, you've been putting money into 401k plans or cash balance plans, profit sharing plans, avoiding income tax. You're avoiding income tax because you're maybe you and your spouse are both working in a very high tax bracket. And then you want to take that money out once you've stopped working and are in a much lower tax bracket. What complicates things is that the federal government essentially says that starting at age 73 now, we are going to, the federal government is going to force you to take money out of your plan, whether you want it or not, because the federal government at the end of the day wants to get paid its taxes. And this isn't such a big deal at age 73. Typically it's about 2.8% of your account value will be part of the required minimum distribution. So a million dollars, $28,000 is gonna come out to you, but this escalates over time and it's not 2.8%. This is based on a life expectancy table that the IRS puts out every year. But as time goes on, uh, those requirement addition distributions become much larger, getting to as high as about 15% of the account value at that time. But maybe you can imagine a scenario where if you've saved a lot for retirement and now you're taking social security, you may not need a lot of money from your retirement accounts. And so these RMDs actually push you up in tax brackets, uh, which really uh, defeats the whole purpose of deferring them during your high income years. So when we get one more year to delay required minimum distributions, that's a big deal. Starting in 2023, we're going to get a couple more years to delay to age 75. So what I have here noted is the opportunity for increased time to consider Roth conversions. So let's talk about Roth conversions. Roth conversions are where we're gonna pull money from your IRA, we're gonna raise our hand to the federal government and essentially say, I would like to pay taxes on this right now. I'm 65, I'm retired, I'm not making any money, I don't need the money to live off of just yet, but I'd like to pay a small effective tax rate so that way my balance is lower and when RMDs start at 73, I'm not getting clobbered by these huge requirement and distributions that I wouldn't have otherwise wanted. So we're going to spread out that tax base. And again, just to illustrate this a little bit further, requirement of distributions, this is just a basic bank rate calculator, I think, just to kind of graphically show you how these increase over time, uh, where the RMDs are relatively small at 73 and again, getting much larger. And this is going to depend on the balance because every year you're looking at a new balance. So if you've had great investment returns, you might take the RMD and still have a balance that's higher than $2 million over time. I just had a flat 4% rate of return here. But the concept is that they're going to get larger and we have to figure out when do we want to pay these taxes. And so this screenshot goes through the financial planning software that I use with my clients. And again, just illustratively shows you a client that might retire you know, right over here They've, they've got these low income years right here. This is talking about their taxes and total taxes paid. But you know, once they get into retirement, the, the taxes actually start to go up. These lines right here um, refer to the tax bracket, the marginal tax brackets that they're falling into. And so a very classic case for a Roth conversion might say, you know, this client right here might wanna start converting some of their IRAs up to this blue line, not above it, but like right up to that blue line. So that way we can pay tax just in this bucket instead of being completely subject to these upper green areas, which get up to the 32% at some time. 
So again, trying to spread some of these uh, bars into those low income years. That RMD being delayed by one year gives us one more year for planning purposes. Okay, and that's a really big deal. There's so many things that go into this conversation. If you've got charitable concerns or charitable, you know, wishes to donate maybe directly from your IRA, maybe those taxes aren't so high at that time. But that's why we really want to look in advance and see, you know, where that's all going to play out. So RMDs, certainly a big one, uh, but certainly many more things that came under uh, Secure 2.0 that we want to talk about. So special catch-up contributions to a 401k of $10,000 will be indexed to inflation. And this is actually specifically for people ages 60 to 63. I know it's a little uh, strange here. So I guess there was apparently a very good lobby for people ages 60 to 63 in Congress these days. But this is starting in 2026, so not relevant quite today, but maybe again, something that if you're in your 50s now, you can look forward to some extra deferral potentially. This is on top of the catch-up contributions that you are used to today for those over the age of 50, okay? Um, there is a little bit of a caveat to this. Uh, age 50 catch-up contributions for high earners, which they define as earning over $145,000, will be treated as Roth after-tax contributions. So that, unfortunately, is a, a very big bummer. Um, essentially, when Congress is going through and making these spending bills, they will help in some ways and hurt in some ways. And this is Congress's way of basically subjecting tax to higher income people to help pay for the legislation they've put through. So if you make over this amount and you've been consistently putting away $6,500 for the over 50 catch up, just watch out next year, 2024, this will actually be no longer a deduction to you. It will have to go to your Roth account within your 401k. Maybe another thing to just keep in mind here, if you are a business owner, you just want to ensure that you do have the provision there that you can offer Roth contributions within your 401k plan. So that way you can still make a catch up contribution, but again, it's going to go in the Roth bucket instead. Okay. Um, another provision here um, for business owners to keep in mind for their employees is that now the employer contribution can be made as a Roth contribution up until today. Whenever you've made that 3% contribution to your employees, it always had to be done pre-tax. So if they've been making Roth contributions with their own money, the employer match had to be pre-tax. So they had two different buckets going on there, but they'll have the option to take that as a Roth contribution if they'd like to. This is supposed to be effective for 2023. In my experience in talking with the uh, custodians uh, working with 401k plans, I haven't actually seen this in action yet but certainly should be something that gets enacted. Some of these things do have a little bit of a delay because the legislation was literally passed in December. So it's hard to enact that immediately in 2023. So my takeaway here, use pre-tax opportunities whenever possible as you may be forced into Roth contributions into later years. So, uh, you know, obviously we've already outlined that here, but I also add on one more idea, which is where is the legislation trending toward? And the trend of 401k plans seems to be taking away those pre-tax benefits for high income people. So if you're looking for large deductions, I would, I would say try to get them now because two years from now, four years from now, I could see this trend continuing uh, to maybe not allow as many uh, pre-tax deferrals again for a high income person. So again, just something to be aware of uh, as you budget your own contributions and, and look at your tax base over time. Okay, another part of Secure 2.0, which was kind of interesting, um, the 5292 Roth IRA rollovers. So this says that tax and penalty free rollovers up to a lifetime maximum of $35,000 from 529 plans to Roth IRAs. This is effective in 2024 if the 529 is 15 plus years old. So set it another way, if you overfunded the 529 plan or you just are not going to use that for education expenses, and your child has had a 529 plan for over 15 years, we can actually take $35,000 of that and move it into a Roth IRA for your child. So now when I talk to my clients about 529 plans and we talk about undergraduate school and even potentially graduate school, inevitably there's some sort of conversation about are we, are we putting too much money into this 529 plan? And I generally say no, because even if, we paid for undergrad, paid for graduate school, that money could still go to your child's child, your grandchild, if you wanted it to. 
But now we get another option. We can actually move it to just your child's Roth IRA. That Roth IRA actually can still be used for, you know, things like a first time home purchase uh, or, you know, just to be withdrawn for their own expenses in their early years because Roth IRAs have uh, that flexibility for taking out contributions. So uh, there's just a lot of great opportunity here from a large estate planning standpoint. Any money that's in a 529 or a Roth IRA is growing tax free. So if we're putting money into the 529 now at age one, and it's going to go 22 years of tax-free growth, and then it turns out they don't need it all, and now we put it into a Roth IRA, it's literally money growing for your child tax-free for life, 80, 90, 100 years, hopefully. Uh, so this is a pretty good um, little caveat. It's not a lot of money, $35,000, uh, and it is subject to $6,500 per year increments that you have to roll this over. But hey, you know, if we can get a tax break, we'd like to take advantage of it um, whenever we can. So just be mindful of that rule as you're funding your 529s. And if you don't have one open yet for your, your child, get one open and put a dollar in it. So that way we can start this 15 year clock for this uh, particular provision. Okay, um, so that was more wealth management. And I should have maybe said at the beginning, I am, there's so many things that are part of this rule. There's, different, there's definitely over a hundred provisions in, in Secure 2.0. I've tried to pick out the ones that I think are the most relevant for my kinds of clients, the people that work with First National Corporation. Certainly there are other things out there. Um, the last set of uh, pieces on Secure 2.0 I'm gonna talk about are for plan sponsors, people who sponsor a retirement plan for their business. Um, or in this case, in this first line, have yet to open up a 401k plan, but have been thinking about it and may wanna consider this a little bit further because now when you start up a 401k plan, if you have startup costs to get that plan in place, you can now write off 100% of those costs and receive that as a tax credit next year. So you still have to pay the two, three, four thousand dollars to get the plan up and running, uh, but you can write that off. So it's effectively uh, eliminating that cost for you, which is great. Um, employers have the option to make matching contribution on workers' qualified student loan payments, not relevant today in 2023, but in 2024, this will go into place. So you can imagine the 23, 24 year olds that you might be hiring, uh, they might not be interested in necessarily um, saving for retirement and they don't necessarily need your employer contribution. So instead you can now make it as a benefit. You're, you're gonna help with your student loan payments. 3% of their income goes to the student loans, uh, which they will certainly appreciate. So you're gonna wanna make sure you talk about that as you're hiring employees this year that might be eligible for the 401k plan next year, okay? Uh, simple IRA contributions are going to go up 10% for employers with less than 25 employees, again, starting next year. So if you're a small business, simple IRAs can be a great fit to keep administrative costs down, especially when you're in your first couple of years of business and don't necessarily need a huge tax break yet. So simple IRA is a little bit more flexible there. And then one more thing to keep in mind, um, required automatic enrollment, at least 3% deferrals and auto escalation of 1% for new plans starting in 2025. Uh, so again, probably not relevant for a lot of people in this call today, unless you have not yet start up a re retirement plan, but this certainly could get costly for the people that are starting up retirement plans in 2025, because you know previously there might have not have been a lot of deferring, not a lot of matching going on, depending on the nature of your business and your employees. But now the government is essentially saying that we wanna make sure these people are getting enrolled and deferring something, and that will end up increasing the costs of these retirement plans for those starting in 2025 and beyond. And again, I should also just acknowledge that it's only for employers with less than 10 employees um, and three years old that are exempt from this. So it'd be over 10 employees uh, and older than three years old that wouldn't be exempt. Okay, so just something to keep in mind, but if you have a plan in place, probably not uh, necessarily relevant for now. Okay. So that's Secure 2.0. I, like I said, there's definitely a lot more to that act than what I've covered today, but I think those are the most relevant pieces for you for now. Um, let me briefly talk about Massachusetts Millionaire Tax, just one slide on this because um, not everybody ends up living in Massachusetts that works with me, so it's not relevant for everybody. Not everybody makes over a million dollars either, so I'm certainly very cognizant of that. But you know, if you've got a property sale coming up in the future, or if you're selling your business in the future, there are definitely cases where that those sales will push you over a million dollars in those years. And so you might wanna be cognizant that the 4% surcharge does now exist. 
So this was passed uh, last November. We, we all voted for this in uh, Massachusetts. I shouldn't say we all voted for it. I think it was 52% to 48%. So we just barely passed it, but now it's law. And if you make over a million dollars, you're gonna have a 4% surcharge on top of the 5% that you already pay in Massachusetts. Um, even if you don't live in Massachusetts, you should be aware that in California, Connecticut, Hawaii, Illinois, Maryland, New York, Washington, and Oregon, similar proposals are on the table. Uh, so we could see this be a, a much bigger thing as time goes on. The biggest way to potentially avoid the uh, millionaire's tax is to file your taxes separately. This is a pretty fascinating development because essentially the draft of the legislation has not necessarily thought about or accounted for this, which I can't explain why, uh, but it's a very easy concept to understand that if you make 800,000 and your spouse makes 400,000 under a married filing joint tax return, you'd be at 1.2 million and subject to $8,000 in taxes. Uh, but under married filing separately, you're not going to be subject to that. Also notably, as of today, and we're talking in March of 2023, uh, you can actually file your taxes jointly for the federal return and separately for the Massachusetts return. That one might change. I've definitely seen some conversation about that, about amending that law to say that you have to either decide to go jointly, jointly, or separately, separately, federal and state. But for today, you actually might be able to do one versus the other. Even if you have to be forced into choosing, you're just going to want to look at those married filing separately tax tables and see you know, where your incomes are landing for each spouse uh, to see if it makes sense. And you may still want to go married filing separately to avoid this 4% um, tax. Okay. Um, so, you know, yeah, as I mentioned, business property sales could be um, affected. The easiest way to um, avoid this is to use an installment sale. Now, there are risks with installment sales, of course. If your buyer um, suddenly defaults and is unable to pay the loan five years later, that, that's certainly a concern. So you're going to need to make sure you kind of weigh the pros and the cons of avoiding a 4% tax versus taking the risk of the buyer being able to make those payments. You know, that's always a concern. Uh, but certainly uh, spreading that out could make a lot of sense depending on how large the sale is. Um, I have here prior to the sale, you may want to transfer half of the ownership to your spouse. So again, this goes to the property or the business. And again, certainly consult your tax advisor on this one. Um, but if you do think you're going to end up filing separately, maybe accounting for that sale on two different tax returns is going to help uh, avoid this tax. Um, a couple of last notes here. Charitable contributions can be planned for those high income years. Uh, it's not like this concept has changed, but it's certainly a little bit more relevant now that this tax exists. So when we, when I work with my clients, when they're in their early 60s, I do start to have the conversation of, if you're going to make any charitable contributions for the rest of your life, let's start putting them in a donor advised fund now while your tax bracket is very high. Because if you make 1.2 million, I'm, I'm simplifying this a little bit, but if you make $1.2 million and we can make $300,000 charitable contributions to get you down to $900,000, well, now we can avoid that tax and you can use the donor advised fund to donate that $300,000 for the remainder of your life. You don't have to donate it today to the American Red Cross or Doctors Without Borders. You can spread that out for the remainder of your life. Just use it now to lower your tax base. So donor advised funds, I think, will be a big deal for people relevant in this situation. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, this one's uh, probably the most obvious one, changing residency if your income is not derived in Massachusetts. If your practice is in Massachusetts, there's not much you can do here. But if you work for a uh, very large corporation that's headquartered in another state, you just live and work here, well, maybe changing residency starts to uh, become a little bit more appealing. Okay, so that's the Massachusetts Millionaire's Tax. We're moving right along here. Now we're going to go into the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So again, this was passed in 2017. Why is it relevant now? Well, at the end of 2025, again, we're sitting here in 2023, at the end of 2025, this act is going to expire. And obviously, I have no idea what will happen if it will get renewed or rewritten or done in any sort of way. Uh, I will say that the trend is that taxes are going to go higher. And so if this does expire, uh, we have a few issues here for income taxes and estate taxes that we're going to want to start planning ahead for. We're not going to want to plan for this in 2025 when legislation is coming down to the wire. I really think we're going to want to start thinking about this this year and next year. 
and take advantage where we can. So uh, specifically, income tax rates would revert back to the 2017 tax tables. So if you're not familiar, the income tax rate, the highest income tax rate used to be 39.6%. Today it is 37%. So in that case, that highest rate is gonna go up 2.6%, but there are some other changes. The whole tax table was completely rewritten. And depending on where you're filing, uh, falling on that tax table for your income, you could see a two to 4% change uh, in your taxes there. Uh, the estate tax exemption amounts, excuse me, of $13 million per person, which today is $26 million if you're a married couple, this would essentially be cut in half, again, going back to the 2017 levels. So, you know, as I mentioned, given the focus on reducing the deficit by both Republicans and Democrats, I would say that today, in 2023, we're in about as low of a tax environment as we're going to get. I really don't see us getting in much better shape from tax perspective. I can be wrong. I hope I'm wrong, but uh, I would be planning for taxes to be going up. So what do we do in the meantime? How do we try to take advantage of this? Well, you know, again, if we've gone through your financial plan and we decide that you are maybe subject to the estate tax, either under the current numbers or under the, what are going to become new numbers in 2025, we might want to start lowering your estate by making the annual gift limit of $17,000 per year. That's a pretty easy and obvious one. We don't have to use your lifetime exemption amount by giving a child $17,000. To clarify, if you're a married couple, that means you and your spouse in total can give your oldest child $34,000 and your second oldest child $34,000. So if that's where the money's gonna go anyway when you pass away, may wanna start planning on that now to lower this estate tax uh, problem because I should clarify, the estate tax is 40% in, uh, for federal taxes. So that could be another, that could be one big one. Um, consider gifting highly appreciated assets to children to avoid higher capital gains rates. This one's a little tough one, I say consider very strongly because um, we do still have a step up in basis rule where if you hold the asset till the day you die, your heirs will inherit that Apple stock or that Alphabet stock at that date of death basis. So if you're 85 or 90, I'm not so sure I'd recommend this. But if you're 60 or 65, I think that's another one that certainly always gets talked about, the step up in basis rule, where they will eliminate that entirely. So why not gift that to a child who's 18, 19, 20 years old, and may literally be paying 0% in capital gains taxes because of their lower income? Why not give them that $17,000 instead of $17,000 in cash, so they can avoid the taxes on that. So that's a possibility. Um, number three is a big one. Consider a trust that preserves your $13 million lifetime exemption and ports your spouse's exemption before those amounts come down. Otherwise, a 40% tax is levied on estates above the exemption, which I just have here. If we were to cut that in half or go back to the 2017 levels, they might be about $6 million for an individual, $12 million for a married couple. If you start to do the planning now with an estate attorney, not with me, <laughs> with an estate attorney who can preserve your lifetime exemption as it's written in today's law, if the law changes in 2025 or 2026, you will have preserved $26 million uh, and not have to ha pay any estate tax on anything below $26 million. If you wait and the exemption goes down to $12 million, anything above that, you're gonna have to pay a tax on. So. Is there a cost to putting in a trust? Of course. Is there an annual maintenance cost? Of course. But when we run the numbers on that, typically these are much lower than the actual tax you'll have to pay. So I think it's worth at least having the conversation over these next couple of years. There's no way you're gonna be able to talk to an estate attorney in 2025. They're gonna be so busy with these kinds of things. So I think now in 2024 are the right times to, to get involved with this. Um, and then I mentioned this earlier, um, converting pre-tax funds to Roth before income tax rise. Some scenarios actually make the uh, case that um, Roth conversions make sense, even if you're in the highest bracket of 37% right now. The idea that the tax you're paying for making that Roth conversion now also lowers your estate. Uh, so we might not be subject to the limits if we continue to do that. If you, anybody's ever heard of the name Ed Slot, he's really famous for um, getting into the weeds on these numbers and retirement uh, moves and, and making sure that your retirement assets stick around for as long as possible. 
So if you're in an issue where you might have to face estate tax, converting those funds and then leaving the Roth funds to your kids um, is a great estate planning um, consideration. Um, last couple of things on this, I just wanna also make sure I remind you of a couple of things. Um, a widow, so obviously for my clients that are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, they may obviously become a widow one day and if that's the case, they get two years of filing their taxes jointly, which gives them a little bit of a break on the tax table. But after those two years, the surviving spouse now has to file their taxes as a single filer. So just remember those conversations that we were having. If you have a lot of retirement assets and they're going to have required minimum distributions of $200,000, $300,000, $400,000 a year, because remember, we're talking about both spouses' retirement plans combined during this time. Imagine that falling onto the single filers' tax tables, and uh, it's going to be a very big tax burden that that individual has to face. So as we look ahead 20 years and think about that, Roth conversions are a really big deal to try and avoid that uh, before the RMD ages start to kick in. I'm also going to note here that under Secure 1.0, uh, which was passed in 2019, Secure 2.0 sort of amends some of the uh, issues that were brought up there. But the big news that came out of Secure 1.0 from my perspective is that the inherited IRA had to be withdrawn within 10 years for anybody who passes away after 2020. The prior rules called this a stretch IRA, meaning that if your 25-year-old child inherited your $1 million IRA, they could take really small distributions for the remainder of their life because they're only 25 years old and the tax table says they're going to live till 90. Those distributions were really small. And so the tax burden of that was not very high. Now, your 25-year-old child has 10 years to take that money out. They actually don't have to take any money out in years one, two, three, four, five, if they don't want to. But by the 10th year, your inherited IRA that you left to that child has to be taken completely out. So imagine your child is, uh, you know, a, a doctor. Maybe they're a, a married couple making two, three hundred thousand dollars a year or something like that. And then all of a sudden, they also have to have these large IRA distributions in their peak earning years. They're going to have very high taxes to pay on your IRA. Which again, the whole reason you contributed to retirement was to avoid income taxes. Now your child is is paying a significant amount of income taxes during their earning years. So, you know, this is definitely a place where I've tried my, to encourage my clients over the last couple of years to do a little bit more planning. So for example, high income children, if let's say you have two children, one is a doctor making a lot of money, maybe they need to be the beneficiary on your Roth IRAs because they're gonna inherit that money tax-free. They won't be subject to this very uh, large tax burden when they inherit your IRA. Whereas a lower income child, uh, if they're making forty or $50,000 a year, make them the beneficiary on your IRA, if all things were equal. Obviously, your Roth IRA is not going to equal your IRA, but to some extent, we can do a little planning here and try to manage your tax base across generations, um, while also thinking about your tax base while you're alive today, uh, to make sure, again, the IRS gets as little of your money as possible. Okay, so... A lot to think about here, a lot of complications here. And I'm gonna summarize this presentation by just really emphasizing why the financial plan matters. Um, really super important, I think, for my clients who are in their 50s and 60s to really start to map this out. If you haven't worked with me in the past, then maybe you haven't seen the screen. If you have worked with me, you definitely have. Um, and this is where I go through with my client, literally every scenario I could ever think of that might happen within their remaining lives. These are some examples of what if we uh, sold the vacation house? What if we retired three years later? What if we had vacations for the first 10 years of retirement that cost $30,000? What if we had to support our mothers for $60,000 a year? Uh, you know, All these different things that affect the financial plan, we can start to project where your asset base is. Priority number one is making sure that you don't run out of money right? Obviously, that's the obvious concern. Um, and we want to make sure we outline that before you leave your jobs. But in any case, a lot of times I find my clients are oversaving and maybe a little bit too cautious, and they're going to end up with a lot of leftover assets. And where does that go? To charity, to your children, to somebody else? Well, we want to plan that out as early as we can and try to take advantage of the laws that we've talked about today 
um, to our to our to the extent that we can, and um, you know increase your overall generational network as possible. So more on that in our next presentation in three weeks. That's going to really go into the weeds on that topic specifically. So that's a little teaser for that presentation. But you know I hope these um, various different conversations around Secure 2.0, Massachusetts Millionaires Tax, and um, um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act will give you some at least ideas. Hopefully a couple of them are relevant to you for your own financial plan. There's always things going on. I'll even say that for residents in Massachusetts, there's conversation about lifting the exemption on that estate tax from $1 million to $3 million this year, which is great, but actually has some planning implications for that as well, because Massachusetts doesn't port estate taxes exemptions from one spouse to the other. So there is some things that have to be done with that. So there's always something going on. That's why I love this job. There's always something going on uh, that changes the rules and we have to read and adapt. So if you have any um, interest in that or have any more questions about our firm and how we can help with that plan, fncadvisor.com. A lot of great resources here about our wealth management, our retirement plans and our investment strategies. My name again, Alex Oliver. Uh, you can find information that I write about on fncadvisor.com slash blog. Connect with me on LinkedIn or email me and uh, happy to dive into your situation um, a little bit further.